Thank you. Can I, is this working? Can you all hear me? I've got a very loud voice. So I'm very happy sh shouting. Um, now, this is me. Um, the picture actually makes me look thinner and taller than I really am, as you can see. So I'm very happy with this picture. Um, but if you have very good eyesight, you can see that down underneath my name is my job title in my company, which is Chairman and Chief Enthusiast. And this is one of the great benefits. If you have your own business, you can call yourself anything you want. So at work, I'm not really a very good chairman, but I'm a really good chief enthusiast. And today, I want to be really enthusiastic with you guys about innovation. Are you up for that? Yes? Fantastic. OK. So I want to take you back um, 15, nearly 16 years when I first started my business. On the left-hand side is my business partner, Dave Allen. Um, and there I am on the right. I still have the same amount of hair, but you see my shirts were much better 15 years ago. And so I still have this shirt in my, in my, in my wardrobe. I'm going to bring it next time I speak, speak somewhere. So this is the smile that you have on your face the day before you start your own business. This is how happy you look, because you have no idea about what is going to happen to you, uh, happen to you next. So this is 15 years ago. And um, uh, then we then um, come up to date. Now, we uh, in my company, What If, we have 300 people. We have five offices around the world. We turn over about 60 million US dollars. And we consult on innovation to some of the largest companies in the world. And here, are some, here is a picture of some of the beautiful people who work in my company, including my wife, who I can't actually point to her. Maybe I'll have to get a pointer in a minute. Maybe I'll come back at the end and I'll point out which one is my wife. Okay? So innovation is my passion um, and innovation is my hobby. Um, along the time, over the last few years, we've innovated some really interesting things. We've innovated these groovy USB ports which stick on the side of, whoop, here we go, stick on the side of uh, computer screens. We've helped EasyJet, an airline that flies into Barcelona, cut its turnaround time on the ground from 55 minutes to 35 minutes. We've invented the first cornstarch bottle um, which, uh, for, for drinking water, and many, many, many other things. So I think we've probably done nearly 2,500 pro projects over the last few years with many, many big, big companies all around the world. And what I want to do with you this morning, uh, this afternoon, is share some very practical things that I've learned. So we've done some good things and we've made some mistakes. So I don't want to talk philosophy to you. I want to talk about practical things that I find really work. Now, what lies behind many of these things is generally my clients who are big companies, they, when I say, what does it feel like working in a big company, they kind of create this image, an image of a super tanker. We're very good at going in one direction, but we're not very good at moving around quickly. And most of the people in my client companies have a dream. I wonder if you can imagine what the dream is. They want to be like this. Every now and then, they would like to be um, a speedboat. They would like to leave the mothership and explore a river the wrong way to see what happens if they can get things wrong and there being no problem when they come back to the mothership. And this really is how it feels for a lot of people in big companies. On the one hand, we appreciate the safety and we appreciate the power and we appreciate the home that we have. But on the other hand, we have this dream of being a bit radical, taking risks, and they're kind of not really set up together to be, to be bedmates. Um, and what I'm going to try and talk to you a little bit about is about some of the practical things that I've found which work really well. You see, it's a bit like with a lot of big companies I've worked with, they've all been successful in the past. They've all kissed the World Cup, but as they get successful, it all goes to pieces, okay? A bit like I am, right? It all goes, it all goes, it all goes to pieces. This is a common problem, I think, with people and with corporations. So I want to talk to you this morning about one concept, and the concept is energy, innovation energy, I call it. And this is what, I promise you, defines 
a company which is successful at innovating and a company that isn't successful at innovating. The successful company has energy. And it's, I call it innovation energy, and it's made up of three components. Um, I'm going to go through each of these in the next 15 minutes. The first one is around attitude. How do I feel about the place I go to work in? Because if you think about it, with innovation, we are asked to think at the weekend, to think in the shower, to challenge our bosses, to say uncomfortable things. We really have to believe in what we're doing. So take a look at some companies. Um, our friends at IKEA, do you have IKEA in Barcelona? It's everywhere, isn't it? IKEA's mission is not to make flat pack furniture, which we spend all Saturday winding and putting up and getting wrong. Their, their mission uh, is to create a better everyday life for the many people. And the people at IKEA do look this happy. They believe in what they're doing. There's a purpose behind it. We all know who this gentleman is. Can you imagine working in a technology company where your boss says, I want you to create products so good you can lick them? How crazy is that for consumer electronics? But it kind of makes a lot of sense if you work in that organization. And with these two people here, as we know, some of the richest people in the world, they couldn't even put a tie on for the photo, but that's all right. Um, these two people here, they, their mission is around organizing the world's information. Now, this is a primarily engineering-based company and a maths-based company. It's very exciting doing, do, do, doing this. If you, work, if you work for The Sims, which is one of the world's biggest games, they talk about video games will be to this century what TV was to the last. It's exciting. It feels like you're on the edge of history. And companies which are good at innovating make it worthwhile. They make the thinking expansive. There's a point more than just doing your job to come into work. But let's make this practical for you. I was working on a project a, a few years ago. It was the most boring brief I'd ever had in the world from a client. Here it is. Can you increase the penetration of our unpopular but profitable after-sale warranties, that means guarantees, on our white goods, that means washing machines. This is from a washing machine manufacturer. How boring, okay? The problem is nobody wants to sell guarantees on a new, new product. So we changed the, the goal or the purpose of the project to warranties so good you would want to sell them to your mum. Much more interesting, and we all know the action standard at the end of that project. And we invented for a, a, a retailer, a UK retailer, a product called what, Whatever Happens. Um, which, uh, which, which, which cracked a lot of their problems. The, the point I'm trying to make here is that if you're going to ask people to be innovative, it's not just enough to ask people to come into work and do a job. Most people in the world want to do some good. They want to contribute. They want to feel part of something that's actually working and making the world a, 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 a better place. So that's number one on attitude. Let's think about behavior a little bit. And I've got... Um, uh, a, a very uh, complicated uh, scientific question to ask you folks. Is this little green thing, which you can see here, is it a weed, like a bad plant, or is it a good plant coming up? Is that a weed, or is it going to be a weed or a beautiful flower? Hands up who thinks weed. Hands up who thinks beautiful flower. Sort of roughly 50 feet. We don't know, do we? It's like with ideas. We just don't know if an idea is going to be a beautiful flower or an ugly weed. That little green thing that comes up doesn't just require us to have the right attitude about our work. It requires us to work with people. Our behavior has to be encouraging of ideas. And the thing that I have found in all the thousands of projects that I've done is you can have any amount of innovation systems or process, but what beats process every single time is that people work together with the right behavior. And for me, the right behavior is all around listening, leaning in to try and understand what someone's saying, and most importantly, doing things quickly and making things real, cutting out business speak from, from work. So for example, if we're working on an innovation project, we will try and work, for instance, in a single week. We'll have the idea at the beginning of the week. Here we are in a retailer. We have some ideas, develop the ideas during the day. During the night time, I'll ask my client to give me his, his store so I can have the whole shop. Um, and during the evening, I will redress the shop at midnight, 
one in the morning, two in the morning, and the next day shoppers can come in and see how it feels. So we'll repeat, repeat the process on the Tuesday night, on the Wednesday night, on the Thursday night. It's a much quicker way of working, and it means there's no PowerPoint presentations, no, no meetings. It's all about how quickly can we get a feel for how this idea is really, really working. And it requires a certain sort of mindset. It requires getting down on your knees, like this chap is, cutting things out, making things, almost, child, almost childlike, the opposite of working in big business. The other thing about um, our, our, our behavior when we're trying to make things real is that in big business, we tend very often to be very rational about ideas. We tend to ask for the numbers very quickly and not engage with the emotion of an idea. And it's very important how we present an idea so the idea is accepted enthusiastically internally rather than chopped down like you can chop those green shoots down. And this is a story here about um, a project I did for the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. You all know what that is, where we're inventing programs for children. Rather than um, present uh, a PowerPoint presentation to the board of the BBC, I asked if I could have one of their rooms. And they gave me a room. Now, if you can see this picture here, it's quite small. It's a picture of a meeting room in an office. A normal meeting room, boring. Really, most, of, most meeting rooms in big companies are boring. And they look, they look like this. Um, and what we did was we hired some ch child actors who were six years old and we transformed the meeting room into a classroom. And we hired a, an actress to pretend to be a teacher. And we got her to stand at the front of the room. And we wrote a script, like a little play, where she could explain to the children, what did you see on TV last night? Oh, I saw uh, this program on TV last night, and it made me think this. Because as you know, whenever we sell things, we're trying to sell benefits, not products. We're trying to sell how it's moved us. And, and rather than explain how a TV program can move children, what better than to go into a room and see children and a teacher talking about what they got out of seeing this, this program. It was a play we created. And you can see on the screen here how we um, um, put pictures on the walls. We put little chairs, uh, the kind of little chairs you see in schools. I don't know. I'm a parent. I have two children. And when I go to my children's school, I have to sit on these little chairs, OK? So we had the board of the BBC, the senior execs, come in and sit on the little chairs in the back. This is the best innovation technique in the world, to get an adult to sit on a little chair, because their brain goes to mush. And they immediately are engaged with everything, taken back to their childhood. But the point I'm trying to make is, how real can we make what we're inventing straight away? By rolling our sleeves up, not using business words, being as creative as we can about making things, making things real. And how much can we forget about the traditional world of market research? I'm sure I was brought up in the world of market research where I spent many evenings on one side of a piece of glass listening to other people arranged in a circle answer maybe 200 questions bam, 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 from, a, from a moderator. What's important for us when we're working on innovation projects is to get out into the real world and be in the place where people are experiencing uh, and really feeling um, the, the new product. So for instance, I might, if I'm working on a food project, I might go to someone's house, look inside their fridge, I might sit down and have a, have a meal with a mum and the children. I did this once uh, working with Heinz, and the husband came home halfway through, and he said, who are you? to me. So innovation has to be dangerous. Okay. The other thing, it's important for us to think about with our customers, what are all the adjacencies? The kind of, where do people really make their minds up? There is no point in talking to somebody who, for instance, has a heart problem or who's trying to lose weight or quit smoking or has a cholesterol problem. It's much better to talk to their, their wife or their husband or their children. They will tell you more about how they feel than they can possibly say. It's very important to think about what I call proxies. Why are people using other things? My daughter, Holly, is 14 and beautiful. Okay? She's beautiful and she's curvy, but she thinks she's curvy in the wrong way, as she sees it. She's always on a diet. She says if you drink milk before a meal, you can eat whatever you want because the food is not absorbed into your body. Right? 
Who cares if this is true or not? It's something that someone believes. There's an insight. There's something in it. It's very important for us to find other things that we're using. It's important for us to talk to angry people. Market research does not pick up angry people. If I'm working, for instance, on financial services, every year I get briefed on the same project from a bank. Can you invent a financial services product for women, um, particularly women who've just been divorced? Now, it's very exciting to get 10 women who've been divorced into a room and 10 men who've been divorced in a room and to get them to stand in a row facing each other because they will almost start fighting each other. They'll get so angry about th their lives and what's happened to them. But in this anger, we can find what is driving their, their emotion. You don't get this in normal, normal market research. So it's very important for us to be very, very creative with where we, where we look. It's very important for us to get out in the marketplace. Here's a picture. In the middle, you can see two people there talking. This is in a marketplace in India uh, where we're researching a new insurance project. My client, we flew out to Mumbai. To, uh, we did all the work in the places where people actually live and work. The queue to buy the product got so large because they didn't realize we were doing market research. They thought we were selling something. My client immediately went, I've got it. I've got to do this. This absolutely works. It's, the, the bravery you need at work comes from seeing things from your own eyes, not, not going to just, just market research. And another thing I found is that many of my clients look like this. They are, I'm afraid, ladies, a lot of my clients in senior positions in companies are men. And I wish it wasn't like this, but they are. And they sell products to people who are very often like this. All right? Can you see the picture? They're different. This is actually a bit like my daughter looks. Okay? They're different. And it is very, very important for, for, for me in my job to make sure that these, these guys get what a life is like to be a, a girl like this. So I will role, do, very often do role plays with these gentlemen where I will ask them lots of questions. I'll say, imagine you're 17. How much money have you got in your pocket? Where do you go out? What are you frightened of? Who do you fancy? Um, what do you do on a Friday night? What do you watch on TV? To see if they can answer the questions. And then without them realizing it, I will get the 17-year-old into the room, and I will ask the same questions of the 17-year-old in front of my client to see how similar or different the answers are. It's a fabulous technique. It costs absolutely nothing to do, and it really gets people really understanding how much do I know my, 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 my my clients. So these are the first two components of innovation energy. What's my attitude? You know, is it a good place that I'm working for? What's the point? Why do I get out of bed in the morning? The second thing is around our behavior. How quick are we? How real are we? How, how throwing away of business words are? How, how much are we getting out uh, of the office? And the final component, and the last thing I want to talk about, is how the organi organization supports us to be innovative. There are a hundred things I could tell you about this. Um, and please catch me afterwards if you want to talk about any of them. But the one I want to talk about is what I think is the most important in the last minute that I have, and this is around stories, all right, around storytelling. If you go into Southwest Airlines headquarters in Dallas, you will find a great big picture on the wall. This is the picture here, and it shows their ex-chief executive, Herb Kelleher, having an arm wrestle uh, over a business dispute. He actually uh, challenged a, a competitor to who had the most landing spots at Dallas Airfield. And rather than go through the courts, he said, whoever wins the arm wrestle will win the landing rights. He actually lost the arm wrestle. Okay? But it's gone down in history as malice in Dallas, the big fight. And what it says to everybody who works in that company, we're battlers. We fight hard. We, uh, we, we, uh, if we have to take a shortcut, we'll take a shortcut. It's the story that sets the tone of the company. And stories, stories tell people how to behave in organizations better than any, um, any set of values, any set of visions, anything like that. It's stories that count. So let me tell you a story here. Um, this is a picture here of somebody who works for us. She's called Robin. Um, the thing that Robin did was brilliant in our company is we were running a project on customer uh, uh, customer excellence and customer service. She went to the airport at Heathrow without being asked to meet everybody who was coming off the plane. She escorted them to our offices, and when she went in the offices, she had these beautiful little cakes made, which had the logo. It was a credit. It was a credit card company. A logo of a credit card written on the cakes that they were eating. 
And my clients thought, this is fantastic. This is such great customer service. We're going to work together fantastically well. And whereas it might take me normally, say, 10 days to get a project, um, it, it took me one day to get a project. Um, so the moral of the story is that you have to be um, a, 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 as you, as, a, as you want, want people to be. So the, this is a story, and I tell the story all the time at work, and it tells everybody how I want people to be. It's, I say who did it. I don't take the glory. I say what was different. I tell people what was the, 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 the commercial outcome of that story. Uh, and it says really how I want people to behave. And what I found with innovation is companies that are great at innovation tell stories all the time about what people have done, why it was different, what was the financial payoff, and what's the so what behind it. And this is motivating and understandable by everybody in an organization. So my last chart, um, and it'd be my pleasure to um, uh, talk to you. My pleasure to come to Spain, the home of sport, tennis, football, everything. Fantastic. Um, my last chart is, sums up really what I call the innovation sweet spot. And that is it's a combination of self. It's a combination of how much do I believe, how much do I want this. It's a combination of behavior. How, what's it like working with my colleagues? Is it quick? Is it fast? Is it real? And it's a combination of what the organization can do to really support me. And there are an awful lot of things companies can do to support people to be more in innovative. One of the best things an organization can do or a boss can do is to tell stories about innovation that's been successful so people feel confident like, yeah, we can do it around here. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.